Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to take this uh, opportunity to introduce you to someone who can use your introduction, but I will do so in His name is Jesus. And are you from? He's from. He's from. He's from. He's from. And when Jesus is from, he rants very well. So at this point, I will turn the floor over to Jesus and make sure the camera is pointing at him because somebody touched it. And uh, we'll get this report. All right. How's everyone doing? Yeah. Somebody moves right. the whole thing. My name is Jesus, and I'm drunk. There's this guy named Abaddon around oh, here, and he knows more about the issue at 11 than anyone that would have ever met, and I don't care who you are. For what? Um, he's got a breathalyzer. He's a drug and murder contest. Um, and I scored a .11 about two hours ago, and yeah. I don't want to say that. Um, and I'm really fucking pissed off. Okay, we'll see. And I'm giving a little rant. A drunken rant. So what do you guys think of Verisign? Fuck fucking Verisign! So I'm going to talk about Verisign, and then I'm going to talk about Diebold. What do you guys think of Diebold? A couple of people know it's a Diebold. Yeah, I know it was fucking bastards. <laughs> A lot of motherfucking assholes up in this shit. Let's go! So, let's go. some motherfuckers, too. Let's definitely some motherfuckers, but I'm not going to talk about that because I don't have time. I'm going to talk about people, and I'm going to talk about Verisign. So let's start with Verisign. As you already know, on September 15th, Verisign deployed a wild card in the .com and .net domains. They are responsible for managing the, the servers for those domains, the GTLD servers for those domains. In the past, when you looked at the domain that uh, you know, was not registered, you would get an error message called R code 3, which said there is no domain here. In bind terminology, this is called NX domain. Um, on, after September 15th, for a short period of time, instead of getting that, you would get a wildcard response which provided an IP address for this search engine, which is known as Site Finder. So, <laughs> so this fucking sucks. And there's a lot of people who've made very technical arguments about this and why it sucks. We went through about three or four harrowing days where, um, you know, no, really nothing was done about this and uh, everyone was kind of pissed off. Um, Paul Dixie, who maintains Bind, which is the most popular DNS server, uh, released a patch which allows you to prevent TLDs from distributing one of these wildcard uh, entries. And a number of ISPs implemented this patch. And, you know, so if you were fortunate enough to have one of those ISPs, you did not see Site for very long. Uh, the rest of us were stuck with it until, well, ICANN, which is the quasi-governmental entity which is supposed to regulate the DNS system, told Veris or asked Verisign very nicely, in fact, to stop it until we had time to assess its impact. And Verisign said, well, you know, I think we should talk about this and figure out what its impact is before we shut it off. This is, you know, then being an asshole point number one, of which there will be a dead many. Usually, when you deploy something on a network, you figure out what its impact is before you deploy it, not afterward. What's so, testing? What? What's testing? What's testing? Testing just slows down the development. Yeah, seriously, we need to innovate here. <laughs> <laughs> that was there. That didn't happen. We need to innovate, and you know, all this testing and all this verification that we're not fucking up fundamental infrastructure is holding us back. You know, we need to like think past that. Whatever. So, um, after a few days more, ICANN summarily told Verisign that they would sue the shit out of them if they didn't <laughs> simply shut it down immediately. At which point, Verisign blinked. But a lot of people aren't following the story closely. They didn't blink and say, okay, fine, you're right, we're, we're going to shut it off, we're not going to turn it back on. What they said is, we will temporarily shut it down so that we can have a discussion about it. And ICANN has had two meetings 
in Washington to discuss the impact of this change on the infrastructure. This is where I really get pissed off because they're really the index. During these two meetings, Verisign basically showed up and said there's no problem. There are no infidels in Baghdad. <laughs> you know, and you know this bureaucratic process that we have with iPad, it's slowing stuff down. We really need to we really need to deploy this stuff. At the same time, in the press, they were they were you know they were writing essays and doing interviews that got published in very key news media locations such as News.com, where they said things like, "All these people that are opposed to this, they're technical zealots." They, you know, their opinions are insignificant and they're operating emotionally and they don't really understand what the impact of this is. You know, none of these, none of these problems that we have are significant. And at the same time, you know, these people, you know, they're not thinking objectively and they're, they're opposed to innovation. You know, and I mean, geez, man, they're being dicks. I'm just not going to sure. Tomatoes. So, tomatoes. Who said tomatoes? You get fucking 10 points. Because very, one of their science technical people showed up at Nanog last weekend. Who knows what Nanog is? Woo! Couple people. Nanog is the North American Network Operators Group, uh, which is basically 500 people that run large internet networks. They all get together, all the engineers from the large ISPs like AT&T, you know, Bell Canada, WorldCom, Internet, all that shit. They all get together on a tri-annual basis to talk about what operational things are happening on the internet and how they can respond to them and how, in terms of how they architect the fundamental backbones and the peering locations. These motherfuckers showed up with tomatoes. All 500 of these people showed up with tomatoes. And, you know, they're, they're being very respectful. They didn't want to throw tomatoes at the Verisun representative because actually many of them were trying to hire him out. They want to get rid of this company's best and brightest because they are a problem. Uh, but uh, they sacked the tomatoes up in front of the podium. <laughs> but you know these people, these people that run the internet, they're 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 zealots. They they are opposed to innovation. They don't like technology, and they're you know they're 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 bad people. And we really shouldn't pay much attention to them. That's the thing. Verisign isn't really talking to us, and it's not. They're not talking to Nanoff when they, and they're not talking to the IT community in general when they're talking to the press. They're talking to the politicians. And they made very clear arguments that management of the DNS system needs to be removed from the government and needs to be placed into a competitive marketplace where people can innovate. And, you know, they, they have some actually fairly legitimate arguments. How many people think there should be more TLDs? Like dot .com, dot .net. Should there be dot .geek? Dot .hacker! Dot .hacker? I mean, I think there should be. I'm kind of pissed off about the fact that there aren't more TLDs, and you know, I can kind of suck. Up until this point, I've never found myself really caring about iPad and really backing them. You know, so I mean, that's valid. But the problem is that the way they're going about it is not necessarily. I mean, they claim that they're talking about innovation, and they claim they're talking about having a market that finds like better solutions to problems that the people on the internet really want. But that's not really what they're doing. Their actions are not the same as their words. Um, the thing is that you can use SiteFinder right now, even though it's shut down. You can take Mozilla 1.5, which recently got released, and you can install it on your PC, and it allows you to set up a search engine that you check if you have a domain that doesn't get resolved. So you can set SiteFinder.verisign.com as that search engine, and you can use Verisign, and it works just, or you can use SiteFinder, it works just fine. The question is not whether or not we're letting we're letting Verisign deploy the site fighter service. And the question is not whether or not we're allowing people to innovate with the infrastructure. The question is whether or not we have to use this service, whether we like it or not. And the question is also whether or not Verisign should have maybe notified people before they were going to change fundamental infrastructure. It's really bad. So these folks have uh, published a... Uh, they, they did a study. They went around and interviewed a lot of internet users, and uh, apparently, 85% of internet users prefer SiteFinder to the, you know, error message they were getting before. That's what they said. Um, Rick Wesson gave them some hell at the second ICANN meeting in Washington, and he asked, you know, could you provide the raw data from this study to the public so we can take a look at this study and determine, you know, whether or not 
Um, we agree with the conclusions that you draw from this information that you collected. You know, what were the questions that you asked? What did people really respond with? And what might you say about that? Well, you know what? They decided that this was proprietary information that came apart from the public. <laughs> So right, it, you know, it used to be that if you typed, uh, you know, if you were telling to a, a host on your network and you mistyped the domain name, you would get a message that said, host not found, host does not exist. Now, or rather, when SiteFinder was deployed, what happens when you tell that to a host on your network and you mistype the domain name is that um, you wait for two minutes for your uh, program to time out because it gets an IP result and then it sits there and uh, tries to connect to it. So I, I think what's important here is that this really, you know, that technical flaw that I'm explaining, you know, they, they've gone out in public, they've gone in the press, they're talking to the government. And uh, if you go on Yahoo, uh, Yahoo's message board for BRSN, which is their stock ticker symbol, and you go back a few days, you're going to find this guy that posted all of the uh, political action committee contributions that people who are executives at Verisign made in the last, like, you know, a few months, they've been contributing a lot of money to various people who are politically powerful in the Senate and in the House. Um, they're talking to these people, and they're saying, you know, we didn't cause any technical problems. You know, there, there really isn't any problem with what we did, but at the same time, they have this whole website. But they talk about how important your software and your interoperate with, what they, with the changes they made. What's really important about this is that it's not really about site fighter, and it's not really about the change they made. It's, it's about who gets to make a decision about what changes get made. It's the fact that VeriSign decided unilaterally that they were going to make this change to the infrastructure and they deployed it. And their opinion is that it's RFC compliant. And, you know, nobody has a right to tell us no. And we don't have to notify anybody. And the really is <coughs> It's about who controls how the internet works. And what's really important about that is that if someone can deny your right to have a DNS name, they essentially deny your right to exist on the internet. If you can't have a domain name, if your website, if, you know, if you're, if you're saying things that they disagree with and they can sort of shut off resolution for your domain, you know, they've centered your site. And the reality is that that's extremely important. That's a lot of power. And it needs to be managed in a way that's democratic. And site finders, or rather Verisize answer for that problem, is probably the least democratic answer that you can possibly imagine. This is a company that has monopolistic, you know, control over the service. It's deploying things like SiteFinder, which, I mean, if they really wanted innovation, if they really wanted a competitive marketplace in which people could decide on different solutions, you know, they wouldn't have deployed a wild card they just said install the zone. You know, they're, they're sort of forcing you to see the internet the way they want to see it, in the way that is most financially valuable to them. Uh, ICANN is a little bit better to the extent that the Department of Commerce controls ICANN, and therefore we elect representatives which go into the Department of Commerce and they, you know, get to make decisions and, you know, maybe they provide ICANN funding and maybe they don't. There is some vague degree of democratic legitimacy. There's a big problem with the fact that it's controlled by the United States because there's a lot of other countries that care about the Internet. None of those countries really have an impact. Uh, I had attempted to hold democratic elections a few years ago in our day. Um, so, I mean, I can definitely has problems, but I can is certainly preferable to the fastest. Um, so, I, I don't know. There's basically, there, I don't know, the question that I have essentially is what should we do about this? And one of the things we can do is not buy products from Verisign. I mean, these people are out there, I mean, how many people in here have a problem with this? How many people think that SiteFinder sucks? Almost everybody in this room. Do you think that there is a legitimate reason that it should be shut down? I mean, how many people think that it's it seriously should be shut down? Almost everybody in this room. Uh, now, when I say shut down, I don't mean shutting down SiteFinder. I mean shutting down the wild card. You know what I'm saying? It's perfectly reasonable to access SiteFinder over, over Mozilla, in my opinion. I don't care. It's the wild card that I think needs to be taken out. Almost everyone in this room thinks a wild card needs to be taken out. You know what? You guys are a bunch of technical zealots. You know what? Your opinions are totally insignificant. You're right. That's bullshit. Why do business with a company that thinks that your opinions are irrelevant? That you're a bunch of technical zealots? Don't do business with these people. I needed, a, uh, I needed a, a, an s mine certificate on Thursday for a very bizarre reason. And uh, I went in Outlook. 
you can uh, say, you know, I need an S line certificate. It takes you to this little web page that Microsoft runs that allows you to buy an S line certificate. And uh, there was only one company listed on this website. It was Verisign. And I was like, fuck, if I'm going to give these motherfuckers money. <laughs> so I went on and I like did some searches. I got on Google and I found this company called GeoTrust. And I bought my S line certificate from them. And it works perfectly fine. And, uh, you know, their customer service was very courteous. I dealt with them, you know, absolutely two thumbs up. They did a great job. And they're not fucking Verisign. <laughs> so, you know, if you need certificates, if you need SBIM or, like, website SSL certificates, don't fucking buy them from these bastards. Uh, network solutions is kind of an interesting element. Uh, you know, when this thing first got deployed, a lot of people said, fuck you, I'm transferring my domain away from network solutions because network solutions was previously owned by Verisign. They sold it a week ago. Now, they still own a 15% portion of the company. So selling or getting rid of your network solutions domain still actually hurts Verisign. But the thing is, there's a very particular reason why they sold it. Most of the regulations on Verisign's management of the, uh, of the .NET and .com TLDs come from the idea that they are, in fact, a network... Uh, they are, in fact, a registrar as, as in addition to a registry. They... Um, they actually uh, allow, you know, people can buy .com, .net domains from them. So they have to run an anti-competitive service where all the other companies that sell .com, .net domains have equal access to the registry that they have. Um, the thing is that, like, if they sell network solutions and they no longer are selling .com and .net registries, then they, aren't, they don't have a conflict of interest. There's no competitive, in, there's no competitive issue here. So a lot of the regulations that prevent them from being a bastard Make a way. So, um, you know, I guess sell your network solutions domains, but, you know, they sold it, and it's, it's kind of interesting. Um, and they will probably go back to the ICANN and argue that because we aren't, we aren't a registrar anymore, we don't really need to, uh, we don't really need to be too concerned about uh, anti competitive interests. We, we're, we're independent, we don't have any conflict of interest here. Um, if you are looking for a job, which some of you are because the economy still fucking sucks. Don't go work for these bastards. Um, if you are, in fact, if you have a job and you have the opportunity to hire people, hire their engineers away. And this was suggested on that. There's some very good engineers at Verisign. They're very good people. And they can't just leave because the economy sucks. And they have house payments to make. They've got cars to pay for. They have families to take care of. If you can hire somebody out of Verisign, hire them out. Um, but... The most important thing here, unfortunately, is to prepare for the internet to fragment. Right now, if I tell you my website is suchandsuch.com and you resolve it, the reality is that you're going to get the same website that everyone else thinks you can get. But the fact is that if Verisign gets away with this and they get to redeploy SiteFinder, a lot of people are simply not going to use ICANN DNS system anymore. There are alternatives. One of them is called um, OpenNIC. I don't necessarily think that OpenNIC is much better than ICANN because it's not as carefully managed as I would like. But you can have you can point your result.com in, uh, in your in your in your machine at OpenNIC DNS servers, and they have .geek, which is kind of neat. You can register a .geek domain, and you can still see .com, you still see .net, but um, you know you can do all this other stuff too. But you can rest assured that these guys are going to filter out stuff that Verisign does that they don't want. It. And you're going to definitely see this a lot more if the entire DNS system ends up getting handed off to Verisign, which is certainly what they want, which is what they're fighting very hard for, and which we certainly have the capability to make happen. So we're going to end up with a fragmented internet. We're going to end up with a couple of different DNS systems, and you can't see one side of the other. And um, you know, we need to be prepared to essentially select the DNS system that, we, that represents values that we think are reasonable, and we need to be prepared for the fact that you know, it's just kind of like Macs and PCs. Some people, you know, really it works on software, sometimes it works on PCs, sometimes it runs on Macs, sometimes it runs on Unix machines, whatever. It's split. And if you have one computer, you're only going to be able to use one, you know, uh, some of the software, not all of it. That's the future we're heading for. It's, 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 it's fucking frustrating. I'm pissed off about it. And the only way to uh, do it to avoid that future is to, uh, is to, number one, don't do business with these fuckers. Number two, you know, Hire people out there now. And, you know, number three, I mean, if you have the opportunity to comment on this stuff with respect to the press, you know, they've done a very good job of spinning in the press. And they're totally reasonable. They're capitalists. They're doing the right thing. And, you know, they're deploying, you know, very innovative, valuable services. And 
you know, all the technical sellers are trying to shut them down. Take the opportunity to correct the press. Take the opportunity to correct the politicians that you know that are making these decisions. Because it's, it's fucking bullshit. I'm pissed off about it. All right. So that was number one. Number two is evil. Boo. Okay. You guys, you guys can see. So, hold on. What? Who don't you want to vote for today? Seriously. Okay, so you guys like seem to react less than people. You don't know as much about this. It, um, it is a bank machine, exactly. These are the guys who built ATMs. But they also built, and incidentally, I don't know, I'm fond of saying Diebold because I want these fucking people to die. But <laughs> it's actually pronounced Diebold, but their slogan is never say die. Um, so, how many, of you, how many of you have voted within the last, like, ten years? A lot. A fair amount. Okay, so did you vote electronically? I mean, you guys remember all this drama in Florida a couple of years ago when they had this Henning Chad, you know, so some of these people were voting with this like antiquated machine that lets you punch this piece of paper. Um, well, they have, you know, very advanced voting technology now where you've got this computer system with this GUI and you get to, you know, touch screen on the candidate that you want to vote for. The problem with these systems is that, um, you know, essentially there's no way to prove that the person that you touch on the screen is actually the person that it registered to vote for. Uh, additionally, the problem with these things is that they're Windows machines and they're connected to networks. And what's worse, in some cases they're connected to the internet. <laughs> Seriously! Okay, so, um, what? Seriously. Uh, yeah, okay, so I'll talk about patching first of all. They have a lot of weird kind of procedures that go around the management of these computers. Um, you know, they want to make sure, they're trying to make sure that these are legitimate voting machines. So what happens is that uh, uh, when there's a new patch for, say, Microsoft's operating system, it has to be verified by a federal government agency, and then in some cases verified by a state agency before it can be deployed on the computers in question. So as much as I respect the fact that they're attempting to prevent patches that actually break the voting, on the other hand, you can rest assured that any voting machine used in an election has security vulnerabilities because it's not patched up to date because this whole verification process takes a while. So, let me give you an example. In uh, now Maryland, the state of Maryland decided to audit the electronic voting machines that they had. They bought voting machines from a company called Diebold. And I focus on, Diebold is not the only company producing electronic voting machines, and they're not necessarily the, you know, the only company with a problem. People seem to be focused on them uh, for two reasons. One is that they're particularly malicious in terms of how they handle this problem, and two is that their source code got leaked on the internet. Um, <laughs> so, uh, uh, one, one guy named Abby Rubin, who's actually on, he's an editor for IEEE Security and um, Privacy, which is a, a you know, very well-respected engineering magazine on uh, computer security issues, uh, did an audit of their source code and published a very interesting paper, which is on the net, you know, sort of cataloging all the security flaws in the software that they've got that you're voting with. And, uh, you know, as a result, you know, he's kind of been, um, you know, muddied in the press. And, you know, if you, if you talk to people that aren't clear about computer security, it's apparently a very bad name. Uh, so, um, anyway, the, um, the state of Maryland runs these evil voting machines, and they decided to get to the, the, the machines audited. They wanted to know if their voting system was secure. Now, I respect that. And actually, I think that every state in this union needs to have computer security professionals audit their electronic voting system. And, I, I, you know, I, that's, that's the right thing to do. The problem is that they sort of managed it poorly. And it also turned out that their voting system was one of the most insecure that I've ever heard of. Um, SAIC did the audit of Maryland's voting system, and you can actually get the audit up on the internet, uh, and you can read it. Now, you don't get the complete copy, you get a highly censored version, and if, if, if you think about the stuff which I'm about to tell you, which is the stuff that they made public, and you consider what sort of things they didn't make public, you really got to be worried. Basically, you've got this voting terminal that you go to that you vote on. You vote on this terminal, and then what happens is there's a PCMCIA card in the voting terminal that you pull out at the end of the day. 
and they take this PCMCIA card to a central computer, and that computer tabulates the votes for all of the computers in that particular district. Then that computer in Maryland makes a call over a pot line to a dial-up with no encryption and uploads the results that it tabulated. Those results are official results, which are tabulated by a central computer called the GEMS system. That system is connected to the internet. What's more, um, the ballot, there's, a, there's this file that gets distributed from the GEM system back to the individual voting machines, which is the ballot. It says what candidates are in the election, and it puts them in a particular order. If you, according to Abby Rubin's paper, if you rearrange the candidates in this, in this, in this, uh, in this file, you can manipulate the election. Because all it really stores is candidate 1, 50 votes, candidate 2, 3,000 votes. So if candidate one used to be the Republican Party, and now it's the Democratic Party, that kind of changes the results. Socialist Party. <laughs> so um, anyway, this file, this file was distributed in over FTP. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so basically, like, I, I, you know, this is security 101 stuff. I mean, no encryption. You know, I, I think there probably was a firewall in front of this computer that was connected to the internet that was doing the official vote calculation, but, you know, there were probably ports that were open. So, as much as I respect Maryland for actually having the balls to audit this stuff, man, that's really bad. Are they still using it? Oh, yeah. In fact, Maryland's re election representative, uh, their elections administrator, said, you know, there are some problems that we discovered during this audit, and we're going to have them all resolved all? by November. <laughs> okay, you know, these guys are transmitting the goddamn ballot over FTP, okay? They didn't even get that right. We're not even talking about, like, what buffer overflow exploits they have in their code or like, what other kinds of problems they have, right? They don't even realize that you should encrypt the fucking ballot. They're going to have all these problems fixed by November. <laughs> Furthermore, Diebold which is the company that sold them the equipment that they're actually using. This company put out a press release saying that this SAIC audit demonstrates the unprecedented level of computer security that their technology is providing for the state of Maryland. Dude, I, seriously, I want some of this stuff that they're smoking because it sounds really good. And Jesus Christ. <laughs> Well, I guess they're right. They didn't specify how unprecedented. Yeah, maybe it's unprecedented. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Probably is unprecedented, which is really bad. Oh my god. So basically, like anybody in this room can manipulate an election in the United States. Absolutely, it is not hard. Jello for president in 2004. <laughs> it's not hard to do this. Stop the exit president. Stop, stop, stop. Quit ranting about that. Oh, I'm the giving the guy right. can and bear aside problem, all right? <laughs> Yeah, that's a good point, you know. We should replace the Department of Commerce with the Department of We should be the new parasite cooperating with us. Yeah! 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 So, okay, it gets worse. There were a bunch of memos where it was basically like an email list where a bunch of people who um, worked for, uh, work for um, Dival people were talking about Dival. We're talking about, we're talking about like managing these election systems, operational issues, right? They've got people in the field that are running these computers. They want to know, you know, um, you know, what's going on? Like, how do we fix this bug that we have, right? Just like any other software company. So they're talking about this stuff, and they're talking about the password of the database. There's a database, there's an MS, you know, MSQL, like, MS Access database on the machine that their software accesses, <laughs> or, uh, you know, tabulate votes, and uh, there's no password on it. Uh, and uh, they were talking about how, like, that somebody had suggested they might want to put a password on it, and there were a bunch of people like, no, no, don't put a password on it, because there were a bunch of people in different districts who needed to go in there and make changes to the database schema. Oh, my God. Uh, they can and they're talking about this particular district in Texas that, you know, the election administrator there did miracles with the database schema during the middle of the election. And, you know, the reality is that they're probably not talking about anything fraudulent. They were probably talking about making shit work at the same time. If you think about what these people have access to and what they could have done 
Jeez. So um, they're talking about all this stuff. They're doing their email. And somebody in the company took all these emails and they posted them on the internet along with the source got them, right? All the stuff they hate this. So um, it ended up on a couple of websites. And summarily, people sued the um, ISP. Or they, they provided a DMCA notice to the companies, the ISPs that provided internet access to the people that were providing this information. Uh, one of them was uh, blackboxvoting.com, a woman named Beth Harris, which was sort of the ringleader of the, you know, electronic voting concerns. She's the person that found the source code that was originally leaked from Google. Uh, her site got shut down for a couple of days, and, uh, you know, it went back up without the contact in place. There were a couple of students who were running, who had this stuff mirrored on their website because they were pissed off about black box voting. Those guys got the NCA notices. In particular, there's um, Swathmore College in a Swathmore. Swathmore. Okay, Swathmore College. Swathmore College. One of the seven sister schools. One of the seven female sister schools. Are One of the seven female sister yeah, schools. Like are these? All right. Well, there are a number of students there that are very happy with this and have this uh, have these memos posted on their website. They got DMCA notices, so they decided to set up this thing where they could change the website where the thing was posted every single day. As it, you know, as a result, um, they started providing DMCA notices to every single website administrator. At the same time, the college decided to shut off the internet access for anybody who linked to the central website, which provided the link to the place where the code was today. <laughs> so, what we have here is a corporation claiming that they have a copyright on a discussion that occurred on an internal mailing list, which is evidence that they are, in fact, um, doing something inappropriate with our fucking elections. They're claiming they have a copyright on this discussion, which is, in fact, possibly evidence of their malfeasance in operating our elections. And they're claiming that because they have a copyright, it is real <coughs> for you to take this information and provide it on your website and so that people can think about whether or not they want these people to be operating in systems that are the infrastructure on which our elections are based. And they're using the Digital Millennium Copyright Act to shut down the websites where this information is made available without any sort of oversight from a court. <laughs> if there is any reason any reason at all that the fair use exception was created in our law for copyright, this is the reason. <clears throat> we cannot run a society in which uh, anybody who, you know, can claim that they have a copyright on evidence of their malfeasance and therefore eliminate it from the network so that nobody can talk about it. Open your eyes, Yes, somebody has. One of the ISPs that got this DMCA notice said, fuck you, and the EFF is backing that. So yeah. there is a fact that it's Ladies and gentlemen, SE 2600 will host it if we get a copy. That can, I can make that happen. We'll do it. I'm going to okay. four servers and you're standing by. <laughs> Anybody that wants to talk about hosting, you have a box after the talk, talk and we'll talk about it. But, uh, you know, I mean, essentially what I believe is that there ought to be a law against using tools like the DMCA notice and other similar things, the general copyright law, to prevent, to sequester constitutionally protected speech. There ought to be a law against this. I mean, it is absolutely obvious, it's totally clear that the concept of criticism and comment in terms of fair use applies to this particular instance when you're talking about a company's malfeasance in managing the election system. That is what these exceptions are for. And the people that work, the lawyers that work in people, they absolutely know this, but you cannot read this law without getting this. This is totally clear. But they're betting on the fact, and they're right, that the school does not have the balls to take them on in court, and that the students do not have the resources to take them on in court. And as a result, they're successfully sequestering, censoring this information. And there ought to be a law. There ought to be punitive damages for people who abuse intellectual property law in this way. That's my take. So what time is it? It's 8.36. In my drunkenness, I ran too quickly, and therefore I only consumed a half hour. Questions and answers. 
I want to make one point clear. Fuck Veriside. <laughs> Fuck Evil. <laughs> I don't know, what can we do? What can we do? Fuck the DMCA! Fuck the DMCA! Well, before I get questions, I want to make one more comment, and that is that there is a couple ways that people are attempting to respond to this. One of the things is the IEEE. How many people here are IEEE members? One, two, god damn. How many people here are engineers of some sort? A lot more. What the fuck? Do you suck at a lot of colleges. Does it? Yes, well, you know what it means. It's just Cincinnati, it's full of a bunch of idiots who have no idea what they're doing. <laughs> alright, alright. So, <laughs> yeah. nevertheless, the United States government has asked the IEEE to come up with a standard for secure voting machines. And uh, there's a lot of people uh, in this particular standards committee who don't think that computer security is a really important part of that standard. Uh, they put out a potential, they put out a like, reference that they were going to pass as their official standard uh, that had fundamental, like, fundamentally incorrect ideas, like the idea that CRC is a reasonable way to verify the, the integrity of information when you're talking about a computer security standard. So, um, if, you, if you're an IEEE member, try to get involved in that working group or try to issue public comments. That working group is a very important thing that you can do to help produce a standard that is a national standard for secure voting systems. Um, another thing that you can do is potentially try to influence your local government. Ask them how the voting system works in your state and ask them, you know, have they had computer security professionals audit the voting system? Ask them, is this information available to the public? Um, there's one thing that I think is, is I, I'm kind of compelling here. A lot of people have talked about having an open source voting system. Amen. It, it occurs to me that there's this sort of gray area, particularly when you talk about a computerized election system between the law and the code. Um, you know, laws are things that you know, sort of mediate interactions between people and society. And when you're talking about you know, software that like, operates something like the internet, you, again, have this thing that sort of mediates the interaction, the relationships between people. It's very similar in a certain sense. What the law says you can and cannot do affects what you do and do not do. In the same sense that what the computer code says you can and cannot do affects what you do and do not do. Uh, Lawrence Lessig, who's a really you know, famous attorney, who I'm sure many of you have heard of, wrote a book about the gray areas between software and law. Uh, so, you know, check it out if you're interested in this philosophical subject. When you're talking about a piece of software which manages an election, codified inside that piece of software is the rules that determine, you know, how the votes are counted, how they're tabulated, and ultimately who gets elected and who does not get elected. In the same way, the regulations about how election administrators run an election codifies how the votes are tabulated and who wins the election and who does not win the election. You cannot have secret laws in a free society. So, in the sense that the code that runs the election system determines the way the election system works, the code is law. And therefore, the code must be available so that we can understand it, and we can understand what our election system consists of. And we can decide whether or not we agree with it. It's, it's you know, it's, I don't know, I'm making kind of a roundabout philosophical argument. I'm doing it with a lot of you in my system. But, I, you know, I think it's very clear. There really is no difference between saying that the code for the election system is closed, that you can't read it, and saying that the laws that govern how the election is tabulated and operated are closed and you're not allowed to read them. And, uh, you know, these companies... I, one thing you have to understand is that the people that administrate these voting systems, they're not interested in this criticism because they've already made decisions to buy equipment. They said, yeah, these evil machines, they're fine, we'll buy like 10,000 of them and we'll deploy them across the state. And, you know, if it turns out that they were wrong, it's their ass. So, they're totally not rational about this. They're not willing to listen to reason. They're, they're, you know, they will spin, 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 spin on this because, you know, they don't care what the right answer is. What they care is that they are right. Uh, similarly, people do not understand open source software. These companies think that if they provide the source code for their software, their business is fucked. They don't seem to get that, you know, yeah, they can open the source and still, like, you know, provide the equipment to do it in a reliable way and provide service for it. You know, I mean, there's, there's a lot to this. But uh, they don't get it. 
hopefully, you know, some progress might be made by attempting to reach out to people that run elections and educate them about what opening the source code for these systems really means and whether or not it affects the business of running voting machines and whether or not it affects, you know, them politically. Uh, but anyway, whatever. That's about it. Let's, let's have questions and answers. I know there's lots of people that want to comment. You first. All right, so on the VeriSign thing, like I run a DNS and my DNS tables got corrupted as hell because things like, you know, give me lots of blowjobs.com now resolves. <laughs> <laughs> so why can't people sue VeriSign for literally... They can. And some people have. Uh, Big Daddy or GoDaddy, whatever the hell it is, Hip Daddy, I don't know. Those guys, those guys run a Mac Daddy, I don't know. Those, is it some DNS registrar? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're a registrar. $10 domains. Okay. Yeah, yeah, those guys, those guys sued. We, uh, you know, I don't know what happened. They sued. There was another couple of these guys are almost as bad as Verisod, but not quite. Um, I, I, I kind of, there's kind of like, I don't know, kind of, I, I kind of like what they did. It's totally wrong, but it's funny because I don't like Verisod so much. Um, they're, they're one of these cheesy ass companies that has domains like Google.com. You know, it's Google with one with one letter on, and they've got this really awful search engine they provide you at that domain. And, uh, you know, so they're, they're slime balls, but they sued. And I think they totally sued just because it'll get name recognition for them. You know, the worst case scenario is that a bunch of people find out who they are. The best case scenario is that Verizon has to give them a bunch of money. You know, it's, really, it's really a good deal for them. Now, as much as I think they're slime, they're, you know, I hate Verizon so much that I'm, I'm, I'm a friend of their enemy. But, you know, yes, yeah, some people have sued. There's another lawsuit that a lot of people have proposed that nobody's done yet, which is that Verizon is typo squatting on your domain. You know what I'm saying? Instead of people hitting your domain, they're hitting Verisign, and it's like a trademark problem. So if you've got a legitimate trademark on your domain, maybe you can prosecute them for trademark violation. Nobody's actually done this yet, but you know a lot of a lot of people seem to think that that's a reasonable case there. Just to Nike. Right now. <laughs> um, right now they are. Um, right now they they, they shut the service down, so you don't really have standing. Um, however, they have said that they're going to turn it back on. And let me let me be very clear about this. A lot of people haven't got this. They got, you know, oh, it's shut down, so it's over. It's not over. These people are very smart and they're very powerful and they're totally committed to, to deploying the service. So be prepared for it to come back. Uh, you know, when the minute they make an announcement and they've said that they're going to give a certain period of time before they turn it back on so people can be ready, the minute they make that announcement, you're, you can see it. And there's a lot of people that are waiting in the wings that I've heard from. Um, you know, I don't know. I've considered it myself, but, you know, whatever. I'm just a poor boy. You. How do we translate this to layman's terms so that we can help people who don't speak the language we speak understand how... In terms of Verisign or the voting thing? Verisign. Voting is a lot easier. But okay. In terms of the Verisign thing, how do we make lay people... Let me give you an example. I mean, what it seems like to me is that when we're talking about shutting down site, I see it's really hard. The terminology here is really tricky. It's really difficult. And when you read some of the things that their their CEO writes, you can see how carefully he plays with the words that he uses. And he'll just say one thing while simultaneously saying something else. Before I made a statement, I said shutting down Verisign. That was a bad thing for me to say it's because I'm drunk. Uh, you have to be very clear about the terminology that you use. Uh, we don't really want to shut down Verisign. I think our site finder, site finder could be a great service. Some people like it. The fact is that, that you can use SiteFinder right now if you install Mozilla and you set your default search engine to SiteFinder. It works fine. So the question isn't really about whether or not this service is okay. The question is whether or not we should be forced to use it. You know? Um, right now, we get to choose. We get to make a decision about what we want and what we don't want. If they get to do what they want to do, we don't get a choice. We have to do what they want. And that is what we're opposed to. SiteFinder to be only the beginning. Oh, absolutely it is only the beginning. And they make that very clear. SiteFinder is something that they brought out. Sorry, what? I was going to say, who, who stop, what's to stop them from pointing this to Amazon and Amazon pays some of that? They are going to do that. They, the whole business model for the search engine is that the links that show up first for your search are the guy that paid them the most money. 
It's not about what's the most relevant result. It's about who paid them the most money. What's stopping them from parking on on uh, registering a domain that's constantly being mis mistyped out, you know, and putting some other site there? Nothing. Exactly. Nothing at all. It's fucked up. Right? It is fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> So you know, okay. there's, there's a lot of conversation we have there. I mean, it's totally possible for them to collect all your email that you send to a mistyped domain. They can just collect it. They can do whatever the fuck they want with it. Now, they say that they're not going to. Yeah. Um, let me get inside, and then we're back. Okay, um, hey, I completely disagree with the fact that they've set this up, but it's not the first time that this happened. When you go to a .cc domain, or .cc right. registry, Absolutely. this has this happened. Going on yes. for several months now. The only reason why no one has noticed is because most of us don't use .cc domains on a regular basis. Okay. The reason why this has become a problem is because .com and .net are global, top-level domains. They are not country specific. There are other country specific TLDs that have been doing this for like years now. And in which case, no one really cares because how often you go to a .jp domain, how often you got do you got RU domain that you're downloading where. No one really cares <laughs> for these things. And the fact that the main issue I think of this is the fact that these, especially ComNet and ORG, are global TLDs. They belong to the entire planet. They should not be run by ICANN because ICANN is a very U.S. centric organization. It should be run by the entire planet yeah. because everyone on the planet uses .com or uses .net. And that is why this has not come up until now. That's, that's okay. The guy, the guy has two totally valid points. Um, the first thing is that there are other domains that have wild cards. An example is not museum. There are more. There are between 100 and 1,000 domains in not museum. That's it. So if you go to a domain that's not registered in not museum, you get an index. People are usually pretty fine with that because they understand that that's what not museum is. They understand that that's how it works. And uh, it's, it's, it's kind of off on the side, and it's for a specific purpose. Um, .com and .net are totally different from .museum in terms of the sort of people that they serve. And, you know, I, you know, I think it's pretty clear that it's a different situation. Um, the other point that he made is that, you know, and I, I think I said something to this effect, ICANN is a very U.S.-centric organization and controlled by the U.S. Department of Commerce. Verisign is a very U.S.-centric organization. .com.net are not very U.S.-centric domains. And the reality is that there are other countries that have a legitimate interest in some impact on how this stuff is managed, and right now they don't have it. Uh, and, I, you know, I, I would like to see a, a situation where other countries have more influence over how this stuff works. But, you know, that, that's another, that's a whole other situation. I mean, that, that's a very difficult problem. Nobody has a good solution to yet. Um, let me let me get him because he's first. Okay, the one thing that I, I'm surprised you didn't mention is how Verisign got fined heavily for sending out notices yep. to other people. Absolutely, people who had registered their name, their domain name with uh, <coughs> Verisign sent out uh, sent out notices saying you need to re-register. Send us money and we'll re-register. These guys are fucking criminals. Okay, they, uh, they committed a fraudulent market, they engaged in a fraudulent marketing scheme. They settled, they didn't get fined exactly, they settled with the FTC within, um, you know, actually the thing was a few days after SiteFinder went live. Question. Me and you. Um, I was just going to say that, that I remember right after <coughs> ICANN came down on Verisign and shut them down or made them turned off temporarily, they were talking about a couple of the other foreign countries. I think Japan and one of the other European countries literally just cut them off. China did. Yeah. They're trying to set a firewall. So we're trying to get cut off anybody. <laughs> 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 the biggest firewall. Actually. The biggest firewall on the planet great is the firewall of China. The great firewall of China. And they, in fact, they shut down SiteFinder now. That's another issue with it. SiteFinder was available in Chinese. So if you speak Chinese, China for one. that's not going to be really useful to you. Now, China, now, there were other countries that did the same thing. This is, yes, there are. This is one thing, though, I mean, Trace is not The language issue is not something that I think you should focus on. <laughs> hey, they shoot the cameras too. Uh, Whoa! Like a moral. I mean, China's the technical issue is for everybody. Order! Order in the court. I am sorry. Come on, Harrison! Everybody, booze up and run!
I, I don't want to focus on technical issues like what language the website is on, because the thing is that Verisign will respond to those technical issues. They'll find a way to manage them. It's not about the technical issues. And that's why they go to ICANN and they say, we can talk about the technical concerns, but we can't talk about the political concerns. The, the, the fundamental issue here is who gets to make decisions about what the DNS system consists of. It's not about whether or not VeriSign's solution works in some technical way or what technical problems it causes. It's about who, who has the power here. Is it something that we collectively share? Is it something that's democratic? Or is it something that's owned by a particular individual who gets to make unilateral decisions? Let Microsoft do it. <laughs> yes, they do. They're, a lot of their a lot of their business is actually being with telecom companies. Their internet business is very limited. I don't know much more they I don't know. You want to talk about it? I don't have anything on the They they've been selling OSS systems, like operational uh, support management systems to uh, the telecom industry, the wireless industry. They're very into that stuff. It's kind of strange. I think that they see a convergence between the internet and like the voice telephone system, and they want to build inroads into the voice providers because they think they can leverage their knowledge of the internet to bring those companies into the future. I mean, they're, they're not stupid people. And they're doing some kind of interesting stuff in that space. You know, but I, I mean, unfortunately, I used to believe that this wasn't true, but it is in fact true that like, you know, whether or not you're evil or good, and whether or not you're smart or stupid, or totally mutually, ex or they're totally exclusive things, they have no relationship with each other at all. I don't know, somebody might disagree with me there, but I don't know, that's, that's the conclusion I'm coming to. Unfortunately, somebody over here had her hand up. Oh, originally, I guess you, that you understand that uh, Network Solutions was started by a bunch of three-letter organizations. Uh, yeah. Okay, you mention that? I mean, I, okay, so this guy brought up a point that um, Network Solutions was, in fact, a government entity. Uh, it started out, I, I don't know the whole history in extreme detail, but if anyone exactly knows it, um, I'd like to know it. But, I mean, they were, they, they were part of the, you know, whole DARPA. I mean, DARPA funded the internet, and this is the military research guys. These guys do research science for the Army. Uh, and they, they, you know, they developed this network, and they ran the DNS system, and they got handed off to Network Solutions, which was originally owned by SAIC, which is a corporation that is... It's mostly owned by its employees, but it has basically a very, very, very cozy relationship with the CIA and a whole other, you know, yes. you know. I mean, the reality is that that the Acorn did not fall far from the tree. DARPA is, you know, DARPA provides a lot of funding to SAIC. I mean, this is really sort of a, a corporation which is very much a part of the military-industrial complex, and uh, you know, eventually. It, it got spun off independently, then it was bought by Verisign. I really don't think that Verisign is closely connected to to um, to the government anymore. Uh, the, the, most of the people on the board, if you track them, uh, they're kind of Silicon Valley kind of .com people. They do a lot of investing in you know various companies that provide network infrastructure in that space. There may be a couple of people that are involved in government that are still lacked. I, would, I wouldn't be surprised if the SAIC still had some portion of it, but it's a very interesting question to try to determine exactly who owns this stuff and you know what influence they have. And also ask yourself, what other companies do these people own? What do they have a piece of? Because if you if you can, if you're not in a position to not buy products from Verisign, maybe you're in a position to not buy products from another company. And maybe the people that own Verisign also own that company. You know what I'm saying? I mean, there are many, many, there are many ways to put pressure on the situation. It's, a, it's probably useful to go look up who is the board of this company. What, what are they involved in? Bayrule.net is it. Look who? Them up, they look them up on the website, bayrule.net. Bayrule.net. Interesting. I'll check it out. Bayrule.net apparently has some details. There's people who sit on multiple boards for multiple uh, large corporations and where... A lot of power yeah. Um, Sam Slavos, the CEO of Verisign, was listed in Forbes list, list of the 50 most powerful people in the world. Um, isn't the problem here really that we've taken this idea, and okay, now this is bullshit, anyways, but the <laughs> idea was that it was all spread out and the internet was indestructible because you could take one thing, and we've taken DNS, which now we all are all dependent upon, and put all our eggs in, well, 15 baskets? Totally valid. Yeah. 
very difficult problem to solve, though. I mean, yeah. if you're going to have one name for that's unique, that references one particular website, you're going to have to have some sort of central authority to work that out. The only way to get rid of central authority from the equation is to have a situation where multiple people can be called Google. Right. And you can, you, when, you, when you attempt to access Google, you get to select from the list. And then you get into this question about who gets to be at the top of the list and who gets right. to be at the bottom. It's a really interesting problem. Um, you know, and this is definitely something for us to think about. We're all geeks. We all can like go and implement interesting solutions to problems. Um, this is a really important, really hard problem. And if you can find a way to, you know, to, to run an internet where you know you can find what you're looking for, but nobody's allowed to own a word, um, that would be extremely useful. And it's it's definitely something we're talking about, we're thinking about. Yeah, I don't think how to do it like you said, New Zealand basically come up with a word is multiply used provided as an index service to everything. How does that work? <laughs> okay. But you can't do it a global TLD unless you have a company in charge. The results yeah. what we're doing. Yeah, that's all companies that you think you have money are evil. Power crunch, absolutely. Yeah, it's power crunch. So you guys are so interested in Verisign. I think evil is a thousand times more problematic. <laughs> <laughs> I agree, but you know what the point of both of your statements is? Is that the people who are on the internet and the average person they don't give a fuck. They want to go to site function. They yeah. want they want to vote, and they don't care how it works, and they wouldn't understand the code of this. Well, that's the thing. But they bitch. They, they call your tech support, and why? <laughs> they, they call <laughs> you. Why does the fuck? How do you respond? Yeah. Uh, people are fucking apathetic, absolutely. People do not understand, and they don't give a fuck, and they don't want to give a fuck, because giving a fuck involves thinking, and thinking is apparently difficult. So, you know, what, I, what I suggest is that you guys are all, you're all leaders, okay? The reason you're at this club, you're thinking about all this super advanced computer stuff, you guys are all leaders, and there are people, regardless of, you know, what you may think, who fucking look up to you, and, you know, they, you know, they, they follow what you say with respect to this stuff. When you say, you know, you should use SSH, they listen. They pay attention. And, you know, this is one of the most important things you can do with respect to things like this that you disagree with, is try to educate the people around you who don't necessarily understand them. And say, hey, you know, you should think about it this way. You know, kind of be proactive and talk about it with people. Because, you know, you can, you can spread the wealth. That, and, and, you know, people will follow you because you are the, the world leaders. You wouldn't be here if you weren't. Awesome. All the senators there, everyone just sitting up with, up with brothers, old farts, and like the guy who had been paid eight million dollars a second or whatever to go to like speak for the uh, recording industry, you know, he was up there just spouting off the same bullshit like he went up twice or something like that. And they were all like, mm, okay, we understand, you know, like they had all been preached to before. And when we had our guys go up there, they were all like farting around and talking to each other because they didn't give a shit. What the issue is, is there's no accountability insurance, whatnot. How's this going to affect people? I mean, you guys had a very powerful effect. I mean, the reality is that they were going to fucking train that shit straight through. I mean, it was going to be bang. You know, it was on the floor, it was passed, it was good. And the reality is that you guys had a very significant effect in terms of slowing it down. It's still kind of on the table, but, I mean, going to the legislature and speaking intelligently about this stuff and being consistent has had a tremendous effect. And we all owe you guys a debt of gratitude for, for working on it. Don't give me any credit, I just kind of sat there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's very important, I mean, and, you know, all of us are in a position to do it. Sorry. I was going to say, I think the most important thing we can do is maybe quote unquote normal people understand this. I personally am probably one of the few. I'm not as deep into this as most people are, but I care and I want to understand and I think it's my responsibility to, to make other people want to care and want to understand by showing them that I that you know, guys sitting over there could go and steal your vote. Literally, you know, some guy in his room at University of Tennessee Knoxville can steal your vote if you steal all the machines or and if you, and if you use that terminology, people will start to care. Okay, so it's 9 one so I'm going to shut the hell up.
And plus, like, I'm starting to sober up because it's been an hour since I've had anything to tonight. So, like, thank you for listening to me. I hope that I was